Hi everybody, happy Friday. Mrs. Wilson here. Last time we read, um, Harry had gotten to Defense Against the Dark Arts late and he was apologizing to Professor Lupin when he looked up and realized that instead of Professor Lupin being the teacher in charge, it was actually Professor Snape. Um, it turned into a not so great lesson. Uh, he lost lots of points for Gryffindor as did Hermione when she was trying to answer his questions. And then when Ron um, spoke up in Hermione's defense, that's when Snape really lost it. And so this is the conversation that they had after class, Ron, Harry, and Hermione. Harry and Hermione left the room with the rest of the class who waited until they were well out of earshot, then burst into a furious tirade about Snape. Snape's never been like this with any of our other Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers, even if he did want the job, Harry said to Hermione. Why has he got it in for Lupin? Do you think this is all because of the Bogart? I don't know, said Hermione pensively, but I really hope Professor Lupin gets better soon. Ron caught up with them five minutes later in a towering rage. Do you know what that... Then he called Snape something that made Hermione say, Ron! is making me do. I've got to scrub out the bedpans in the hospital wing without magic. He was breathing deeply, his fists clenched. I couldn't black if hidden in Snape's office, eh? He could have finished him off for us. And that's where we left off. Harry woke extremely early the next morning, so early that it was still dark. For a moment, he thought of the roaring of the wind and that had woken him up. Then he felt a cold breeze on the back of his neck and sat bolt upright. Peeves the poltergeist had been floating next to him, blowing hard in his ear. What did you do that for? said Harry furiously. Peeves puffed out his cheeks, blew hard and zoomed backward out of the room, cackling. Harry fumbled for his alarm clock and looked at it. It was half past four. Cursing Peeves, he rolled over and tried to get back to sleep, but it was very difficult now that he was awake to ignore the sounds of the thunder rumbling overhead pounding of the wind against the castle walls and the distant creaking of the trees in the forbidden forest. I have trouble getting back to sleep in the middle of the storm too. In a few hours, he would be put, he would be out on the Quidditch field battling through that gale. Finally, he gave up any more thought of sleep, got dressed, picked up his Nimbus 2000 and walked quietly out of the dormitory. As Harry opened the door, <clears throat> something brushed against his leg. He bent down just in time to grab Crookshanks by the end of his bushy tail and drag him outside. You know, I reckon Ron was right about you, Harry told Crookshanks, Crookshanks suspiciously. There are plenty of mice around this place. Go and chase them. Go on, he added. Oh my goodness, Chili's here too. Nudging Crookshanks down the spiral staircase with his foot. Leave Scabbers alone. The noise of the storm was even louder in the common room. Harry knew much better than to think the match would be canceled. Quidditch matches were not called off for trifles like thunderstorms. Nevertheless, he was starting to feel very apprehensive. Wood had pointed out Cedric Diggory to him in the corridor. Diggory was a fifth year and a lot bigger than Harry. Seekers were usually light and speedy, but Diggory's weight would be an advantage in this weather because he was less likely to be blown off course. Harry whiled away the hours until dawn in front of the fire, getting up every now and then to stop Crookshanks from sneaking up the boys' staircase again. At long last, Harry thought it must be time for breakfast, so he headed through the portrait hole again, alone. Stand and fight, you mangy cur, yelled Sir Cadigan. Oh, shut up, Harry yawned. He revived a bit over a large bowl of porridge, and by the time he'd started on toast, the rest of the team had turned up. It's going to be a tough one, said Wood, who wasn't eating anything. Oh, stop worrying, Oliver, said Alicia soothingly. We don't mind a bit of rain. But it was considerably more than a bit of rain. Such was the popularity of Quidditch that the whole school turned out to watch the match as usual. They ran down the lawns toward the Quidditch fields, heads bowed against the ferocious wind, umbrellas being whipped out of their hands as they went. Just before he entered the locker room, Harry saw Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle laughing and pointing at him from an under, under an enormous umbrella on their way to the stadium. The team changed into their scarlet robes and waited for Wood's usual pe pre-match pep talk, but it didn't come. 
He tried to speak several times, made an odd gulping noise, then shook his head hopelessly and beckoned them to follow him. The wind was so strong that they staggered sideways as they walked out into the field. If the crowd was cheering, they couldn't hear it over the fresh rolls of thunder. Rain was splattering over Harry, Harry's glasses. How on earth was he gonna see the snitch in this? Belva Puffs were approaching from the opposite side of the field wearing canary yellow robes. The captains walked up to each other and shook hands. Diggory smiled at Wood, but Wood now looked as though he had lockjaw and merrily nodded. Mount your brooms, Madam Hooch's mouth formed the words. He pulled his right foot out of the mud with a squelch and swung it over his Nimbus 2000. Madam Hooch put her whistle to her lips, gave it a blast that sounded shrill and distance, distant, and they were off. Harry rose fast, but his Nimbus was serving, swerving slightly with the wind. He held it as steady as he could and turned, squinting into the rain. Within five minutes, Harry was soaked to his skin and frozen, hardly able to see his teammates, let alone the tiny snitch. He flew backward and forward across the field past blurred red and yellow shapes with no idea of what was happening in the rest of the game. Couldn't hear the commentary over the wind. The crowd was hidden beneath a sea of cloaks and battered umbrellas. Twice, Harry came very close to being unseated by a bludger. His vision was so clouded by the rain on his glasses, he hadn't seen them coming. He lost track of time. It was getting harder and harder to hold his broom straight. The sky was getting darker, as though night had decided to come early. Twice, Harley nearly hit another player. Without knowing whether it was a teammate or opponent, everyone was so wet now, and the rain so thick, he could hardly tell them apart. With the first flash of lightning came the sound of Madame Hooch's whistle. Harry could just see the outline of wood through the thick rain gesturing him to the ground. The whole team splashed down into the mud. I called for a timeout, Wood roared to his team. Come on, under here. They huddled at the edge of the field under a large umbrella. Harry took off his glasses and wiped them hurriedly on his robes. What's the score? We're up 50 points, said Wood, but unless we get the snitch soon, we'll be playing into the night. I got no chance with these on, Harry said exasperatedly, waving his glasses. At that very moment, Hermione appeared at his shoulder. She was holding her cloak over her head and was inexplicably beaming. I had an idea, Harry. Give me your glasses, quick. She handed them to her, or he handed them to her, and as the team watched in amazement, Hermione tapped them with her wand and said, impervious. There, she said, handing them back to Harry. They'll repel water. Wood looked as though he could have kissed her. Brilliant, he called hoarsely after she disappeared into the crowd. Okay, team, let's go for it. Hermione's spell had done the trick. Harry was still numb with cold, still wetter than he'd ever been in his life, but he could see. Full of fresh determination, he urged his broom through the turbulent air, staring in every direction for the snitch, avoiding a bludger, ducking beneath Diggory, who was streaking in the opposite direction. There was another clap of thunder, followed immediately by forked lightning. This was getting more and more dangerous. Harry needed to get the snitch quickly. He turned, intending to head back toward the middle of the field, but at that moment, another flash of lightning illuminated the stands, and Harry saw something that distracted him completely. The silhouette of an enormous, shaggy, black dog, clearly imprinted against the sky, motionless in the topmost empty row of seats. Harry's numb hand slipped on the broom handle, and his nimbus dropped a few feet. Shaking his sodden bangs out of his eyes, he squinted back into the stands, and the dog had vanished. Harry! came Wood's anguished yell from the Gryffindor goalpost. Harry, behind you! Harry looked wildly around. Cedric Diggory was pelting up the field, and a tiny speck of gold was shimmering in the rain-filled air between them. With a jolt of panic, Harry threw himself flat to the broom handle and zoomed toward the snitch. Come on, he growled at his nimbus as the rain whipped his face faster. But something odd was happening. An eerie silence was falling across the stadium. The wind, though as strong as ever, was forgetting to roar. It was as though someone had turned off the sound, as though Harry had suddenly gone deaf. What was going on? And then a horribly familiar wave of cold swept over him, inside him just as he became aware of something moving on the field below. 
Before he'd had time to think, Harry had taken his eyes off the snitch and looked down. At least a hundred Dementors, their hidden faces pointing up at him, were standing beneath him. It was as though freezing water were rising in his chest, cutting in his insides, and then he heard it again. Someone was screaming, screaming inside his head. A woman, not Harry, not Harry, please not Harry. Stand aside, you silly girl, stand aside now. Not Harry, please no, take me, kill me instead. Numbing, swirling white mist was filling Harry's brain. What was he doing? Why was he flying? He needed to help her. She was gonna die. She was going to be murdered. He was falling, falling through the icy mist. Not Harry, please have mercy, have mercy. A shrill voice was laughing. The woman was screaming and then Harry knew no more. Lucky the ground was so soft. I thought he was dead for sure, but he didn't even break his glasses. Harry could hear the voices whispering, but they made no sense whatsoever. He didn't have a clue where he was or how he got there or what he'd been doing before he got there. All he knew was that every inch of him was aching as though it had been beaten. That was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. Scariest, the scariest thing, hooded black figures, cold, screaming. Harry's eyes snapped open. He was lying in the hospital wing. The Gryffindor Quidditch team spattered with mud from head to foot was gathered round his bed. Ron and Hermione were also there, looking as though they'd just climbed out of a swimming pool. Harry, said Fred, who looked extremely white underneath the mud. How are you feeling? It was as though Harry's memory was on fast forward. The lightning, the grim, the snitch, and the dementors. What happened, he said, sitting up so suddenly they all gasped. You fell off, said Fred. Must have been, what, 50 feet? We thought you died, said Alicia, who was shaking. Hermione made a small squeaky noise. Her eyes were extremely bloodshot. But the match, said Harry, what happened? Are we doing a replay? <clears throat> no one said anything. The horrible truth sank into Harry like a stone. We didn't lose? Diggory got the snitch, said George, just after you fell. He didn't realize what had happened. When he looked back and saw you on the ground, he tried to call it off, wanted a rematch, but they won fair and square. Even Wood admits it. Where is Wood, said Harry, suddenly realizing he wasn't there. Still in the shower, said Fred. We think he's trying to drown himself. Harry put his face to his knees, his hands gripping his hair. Fred grabbed his shoulder and shook it roughly. Come on, Harry, you've never missed a snitch before. There had to be one time you didn't get it, said George. It's not over yet, said Fred. We lost by 100 points, right? So if Hufflepuff loses to Ravenclaw and we beat Ravenclaw and Slytherin, Hufflepuff, Hufflepuff will have to lose by at least 200 points, said George. But if they beat Ravenclaw, no way, Ravenclaw's too good. But if Slytherin loses against Hufflepuff, it all depends on the points, a margin of 100 either way. Harry lay there not saying a word. They had lost for the first time ever. He had lost a Quidditch match. After 10 minutes or so, Madame Pomfrey came over to tell the team to leave him in peace. We'll come see you later, Fred told him. Don't beat yourself up, Harry. You're still the best seeker we have ever had. The team trooped out, trailing mud behind them. Madame Pomfrey shut the door behind them, looking disapproving. Ron and Hermione moved nearer to Harry's bed. Dumbledore was really angry. Hermione said in a quaking voice, I have never seen him like that before. He ran onto the field as you fell, waved his wand, and you sort of slowed down before you hit the ground. Then he whirled his wand at the Dementors, shot silver stuff at them. They left the stadium right away. He was furious they had come onto the grounds. We heard him. Then he magicked you onto a stretcher, said Ron, and walked up to the school with you floating on it. Everyone thought you were. His voice faded. But Harry hardly noticed. He was thinking about what the Dementors had done to him, about the screaming voice. He looked up and saw Ron and Hermione looking at him so anxiously that he quickly cast around for something matter of fact to say. Did someone get my Nimbus? Ron and Hermione quickly looked at each other. Uh, what, said Harry, looking from one to the other. Well, when you fell off, it got blown away, said Hermione hesitantly. And, and it hit, it hit, oh, Harry, 
It hit the Whomping Willow. Harry's insides lurched. The Whomping Willow was a very violent tree that stood alone in the middle of the grounds. And, he said, dreading the answer. Well, you know the Whomping Willow, said Ron. It, it doesn't like being hit. Professor Flitwick brought it back just before you came around, said Hermione in a very small voice. Slowly, she reached down for a bag at her feet, turned it upside down, and tipped a dozen bits of splintered wood and twig onto the bed. The only remains of Harry's faithful, finally beaten broomstick. And that's the end of chapter nine, Grim Defeat. So I'm understanding the title a little bit better now. We know that the Grim is often a sign uh, or an omen that something bad is gonna happen. And so I think probably what Harry is assuming is that the, the dog that he saw on the stands right before his accident and the Dementors came onto the field was a Grim, but also it was a pretty grim defeat if we're thinking about the um, actual meaning of the word. So chapter nine, I'm sorry, chapter 10 is titled The Marauder's Map. We know what maps are, but we don't know what a marauder is. And so i um, interested to find out how that makes this map different from other maps. And so we shall pick back up with the book on Monday. In the meantime, I hope that you have a wonderful weekend and I can't wait for us to read together again soon.